Well, welcome everyone once again. My name is Armani Johnson and I will be your moderator for today. I'm a licensed occupational therapist and I serve as the Young Professionals Leadership Committee Co-Chair for the Metro DC Board of the Arthritis Foundation. I am also a patient, an arthritis patient. I have been living with rheumatoid arthritis for seven years now. For months prior to my diagnosis, I struggled to complete my daily activities until I found the courage to finally seek help and treatment. When I was first diagnosed with arthritis, many of you, like many of you, I had a lot of questions and concerns. I know how overwhelming a diagnosis of arthritis and living with pain can be, but with education, self-management strategies, and the right healthcare team, I have been able to create, to create a fulfilling life. Throughout my journey to achieving a fulfilling life, it has been my purpose as an occupational therapist to empower others living with arthritis, creating opportunities for success and improving quality, quality of life for people experiencing challenges like myself. African Americans experience a greater burden when it comes to living with arthritis, from delayed diagnosis and treatment to experiencing more pain and disability. That's why tonight's experts and I will discuss key information to help you manage your symptoms and disease, including treatments, lifestyle measures, and tips to advocate for yourself so you can live a full life with arthritis. One resource that can help you live your best life with arthritis is the Arthritis Foundation's VIM app. Through the app, you can track your pain and symptoms, set realistic goals for better arthritis management, and cheer on a community of other people living with arthritis. So let's take a few moments. Let's watch a short video explaining a little bit more about this great tool. When you download the free VIM app from the Arthritis Foundation, you'll be able to set achievable goals for your pain level, ability, and lifestyle. Congratulations, Janice. You hit your goal. I knew you could do it. And find a wealth of information to help you manage your chronic pain. This recipe is a big help with joint inflammation. while also becoming a member of a community that offers advice, encouragement, and support 24 hours a day. Janice, you're doing so much better. Thanks for saying that. Ready to go to lunch? Wouldn't miss it. Download the free VIM app from the Arthritis Foundation and start taking back what chronic pain has taken away. Awesome, awesome. So if you haven't already downloaded the VIM app, you can take time to do that now. Um, but a few housekeeping notes about tonight's event. Um, the webinar will be broken down into two parts. So first we'll have a short presentation about the basics of arthritis and how they affect our community, followed by an in-depth discussion and Q&A to address common concerns and questions. Um, in addition, we have muted all attendees for this event, but you can direct any questions you may have throughout the presentation to the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen. After tonight's session, you will receive an email about your experience. These surveys help us to track the success of these sessions and better help plan for future events. So please take time to fill them out at your convenience. Okay. So we'll get started by introducing our wonderful expert panel. First, we have Dr. Lydia Bess. Dr. Bess is a board certified, is board certified in family medicine and currently serves as the medical director of the Baylor Scott and White Health and Wellness Center. She is committed to providing personalized quality care to the community of Dallas and has experience in several practice settings, including hospital-based care, community primary care, and private practice. Before relocating to Dallas, Dr. Best served for nine years as medical director at Covenant Community Care in Detroit. Welcome, Dr. Best. Next, we have Dr. Sharon Dowell. 
Dr. Dowell is an associate professor of internal medicine at Howard University. She participates in clinical research trials in systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, and gout. Dr. Dow is also committed to medical education and is a course director for the Introduction to Clinical Medicine course for second year medical students. She has also been instrumental in introducing patient-centered education in her clinicals and is currently researching the relationship of patient education to medication compliance and health outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Dowell. Last but not least, we have Dr. Aham Onike. Dr. Onike is a board certified fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon who specializes in hip and knee replacement. He is also a member of the MedStar Orthopedic Institute and the owner of Avant Orthopedics, which has locations in DC, Maryland, and Nigeria. Dr. Onike has presented at US and international conferences and is widely published in peer-reviewed orthopedic journals. He is also a reviewer for clinical orthopedics and related research. In addition to treating patients, Dr. Onike is very involved with humanitarian work, including through his nonprofit foundation, Operation Stand, Walk, Run, which has two hospitals in Nigeria. In 2019, he was named as Humanitarian Award winner by the Healthcare Corporation of America for his work. Welcome, Dr. Onike. Thank, Thank you, you all so much for joining us tonight. And Thank, to you. Us Thank you. And to kick us off, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Best for a brief presentation about how arthritis impacts our community. Dr. Best. Thank you so much for having me and we can advance to the next slide. I just wanna say I'm honored to be on this distinguished panel and I'm coming from the perspective of a primary care doctor working in a community health center with about 70% of our patients being uninsured. So that's the perspective I come from. And from that perspective, I've seen a lot of people with joint pain. I've heard a lot of truths and some myths about old Arthur. So here are a few listed here. I think the most common misconceptions about arthritis are that exercise will make it worse or that there's nothing that anyone can do to help. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Arthritis um, is experienced differently in African-Americans and other races um, versus Caucasian Americans. So in addition to reporting more pain and limitations, the pain can be different. It can involve often the larger joint, joints such as the knee or the spine in African-Americans, whereas Caucasians are more likely to have arthritis present in their hands. We can go to the next slide. We um, often get questions as to why African-Americans have an un undue burden um, when it comes to chronic conditions like arthritis. Some of the theories are that sometimes African-Americans uh, delay seeking medical care. A lot of people say, you know, they wait until the, the, the pain becomes unbearable. Um, African-Americans might participate more in activities that may cause injury. Um, I know my father, brother, and husband have all been in the military and all have stories to tell about their service and marching in the snow. Also, sports injuries or heavy lifting at work can increase the risk of arthritis later. And weight and lack of access to affordable care can disproportionately affect African-Americans. Next slide. Here's some pictures of joints. The far left shows a healthy joint. The next one is um, cartilage damage. And then the, the last one shows inflammatory type damage. Um, arthritis is considered a type of chronic pain. So acute pain happens quickly and goes away with treatment usually. Often it's due to injury. Whereas chronic pain is pain that lasts six months or longer and it can continue after the illness or the injury has been treated. So arthritis is in that second category. And sometimes once the damage to the joint is done, it can't be reversed. Next slide. While there's no one single test or symptom that we can use to diagnose arthritis, seeking a doctor or a medical provider is 
the first step in identifying the problem and working on solutions. So here are some tests that we can do in the office um, during, a thorough, during a thorough history of course, uh, examining their joints. Sometimes we do blood tests and sometimes we do x-rays. So I do wanna say those aren't necessarily the first steps in managing pain. So don't be alarmed if that's not the go-to thing the providers provided that first visit. Next slide. I wanna talk about the common types of arthritis. Um, osteoarthritis, sometimes called degenerative joint disease or wear and tear arthritis is the most common type. It affects over 58 million Americans. Um, or I should say if out of the 58 million Americans with arthritis, uh, about 30 million have osteoarthritis. The next most common type is inflammatory arthritis. And we showed that on that third joint slide with the red inflammation. Um, that can affect many people though less than the osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid is one type of inflammatory arthritis that affects about 2 million people. Gout is a different type of arthritis and that can affect about 1 million people. And fibromyalgia, though it is a pain sensitization, it is not considered arthritis. It can be confused with arthritis and is sometimes treated by the same doctors as arthritis. Next slide. So understanding the different types of arthritis depends on the symptoms, um, the timing of the symptoms, the duration of the symptoms, and the location. So here we're comparing osteoarthritis to inflammatory arthritis. So osteoarthritis is usually limited, often in those joints that had the injury, whereas inflammatory arthritis can affect more than just the joint joints. Certainly, it can affect the whole body. Uh, often, it is symmetric or equal on both sides of the body. Um, Osteoarthritis can get worse as the day goes on, whereas inflammatory type, type arthritis usually presents worse in the morning. Um, they can both have morning st stiffness, but osteoarthritis, the morning stiffness usually goes away within an hour, whereas uh, with the inflammatory type, that morning stiffness can last over an hour. Those are some of the differences. Next slide. Then we'll talk about the, the gout and the fibromyalgia as well. So gout, you may have heard, is very common in men. Um, it usually presents as a severe acute pain that um, comes and goes within a week, whereas fibromyalgia usually is a chronic pain. It can affect multiple joints. It's usually described as a tenderness, and it can affect more than just joints. There's tender spots that can vary throughout the month, but often it's a chronic consistent pain. Next slide. Thank you. So again, we did talk about the timing and location of symptoms uh, that helps us determine the type of arthritis you may have. For example, uh, do you have pain in the morning or the evening? Is it your knee? Is it stiff? Is it swollen? Do you have pain on both sides? Or do you have general pain? So in your, in, in, when you're present, pre preparing for your medical visit, it's good to write down your symptoms and write down the activities that may have caused them and the activities that help relieve them. Because that's one of the things your provider is going to ask you. So tracking your symptoms along with your medications can really help uh, figure out the best management for you. Next slide. Even though we're not going to go into detail about the medications, just keep in mind that the inflammatory arthritis and also fibromyalgia require regular medication to manage the disease. Next slide. So just in general, there are many different types of medications to relieve the pain and even more importantly, to stop disease progression. So no matter where you are on your continuum with pain and management, it's always a good idea to check in with your provider, don't stop medications on your own, and find the best fit for you. Here we see the top of the list are those anti-inflammatory medications or NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, 
uh, medications, many of which are over the counter and some are uh, available in a stronger prescription strength. Then the others are the DMARDs or disease modifying um, arthritis uh, drugs. Those often are injections, not always, and usually require a, a medical specialist for at least starting those medications. And then there are topical medications, which again can be over the over the counter or prescription. Next slide, please. I want to talk about a library that the Arthritis Foundation has made available called um, Your Exercise Solution. And like that first video, if there are videos and tips for um, modifications made to physical activity that can keep you safe at any activity level. And I just want to say for that first video, I love that video about um, the app, but I did have to watch it twice to figure out that those people weren't in the room with her except for her, her husband or significant other, but there's many more videos available on the library. Next slide. Now I want to talk about a subject that sometimes we don't want to hear about, me included, and that's a healthy weight. Now, a healthy weight is different for different people, but excess weight can affect arthritis. Losing weight can ease the pressure on painful joints, and it can slow down the progression, especially for wear and tear arthritis. For the inflammatory arthritis, losing weight can reduce inflammation, as well as um, reducing the likelihood of um, worsening of other chronic diseases. So it's not just for arthritis, it's for the whole body. Next slide. So part of losing weight, as we know, is a healthy diet. There's no special diet for arthritis. There's no magic diet for arthritis, but any diet that eases your symptoms and more importantly, inflammation can help. So a Mediterranean diet or a diet high in healthy fat, like olive oil and salmon, and most importantly, whole grains and vegetables is, uh, is healthier and can decrease inflammation and uh, help get you moving more. Next slide. So when it comes to managing your symptoms, how you treat your joints does matter. So we do wanna make sure that we warm up and cool down before exercising. And I think we hear that a lot, but we might not understand the importance of it. But we don't wanna be a weekend warrior. And just keep in mind, we can do damage when we jump from one activity to another without getting our joints warmed up for that activity. Next slide. We also want to look at uh, ways to make work healthier and safer. So an ergonomic keyboard can help, um, assist devices can help, and those often are prescribed and I think best prescribed by a medical professional. Um, I've seen a lot of websites that advertise direct to the consumer, different types of braces. Some of those braces aren't necessarily going to help and they might hurt the pocketbook. So I do always advise my patient, ask before you buy those. There's also physical and occupational therapy. Acupuncture does serve a role and heat and ice is a modality that it's used. You've seen it with sports stars and it helps, um, it helps us regular people with regular jobs as well. So keep those in mind. Next slide. I'm sure you've heard about supplements, you've thought about supplements, you've probably been recommended to take supplements from a well-meaning friend or someone on the internet trying to sell you their product. One of those items that we've heard about probably on a daily basis is CBD. And a word of warning about CBD, there have been studies to see if there's a benefit for CBD. When you buy something off the street or on the internet, or over the counter, you can never be sure how much of that active ingredient you're getting. So I think the jury is still out on whether CBD helps, but just keep in mind what you're buying may be a very small amount of CBD. Um, sometimes things that, that tingle are added to the product so you feel like it's working like menthol, you know that tingles, capsaicin tingles, camphor. So Again, you can find lower price items like uh, BioFreeze or Tiger Bomb. Um, so keep that in mind when you're looking at um, supplements or over-the-counter relief. Next slide. 
So we've talked about uh, exercise or movement, we've talked about diet, we've talked about supplements. We do wanna keep in mind that the mind and the body are one. So in addition to medications and movement, we do have to look at our emotional health and how that impacts pain and how improving sleep and stress management can improve pain. So these are some of the techniques for coping strategies that can help with chronic pain. Next slide. Now arthritis is one of a group of diseases, but it can impact health overall, including osteoporosis. But I do wanna make the distinction, I have had some patients that have confused osteoarthritis with osteoporosis. So osteoporosis has to do with the bone density and the risk of fracture, whereas arthritis has to do with the joints. Um, there can also be health effects mentally, such as arthritis, uh, excuse me, such as anxiety and depression from arthritis. And chronic diseases like diabetes can be worsened by arthritis. Uh, there's also uh, interactions with medications that can help or uh, hinder healing with arthritis or with the other chronic disease. So that's why you want a medical professional involved at all levels of care. Next slide. So uh, I think what we're coming to is that there's a balance. Um, arthritis is a chronic disease, just like diabetes. Some days will be better than others. Being consistent with medication and movement, I think are the two most important things that we can do for chronic pain. Next slide. And I'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Johnson. Dr. Best, thank you so much for such a well-rounded look at arthritis. Thank you, thank you. Um, so now we'll actually continue the conversation and open it, open it up to our expert panel about the top things you need to know about managing your arthritis. As a reminder, you can type any questions that you may have into the Q&A chat function at the bottom of your screen. Please keep in mind that we have received hundreds of questions before the webinar, and we will try to get through as many as possible today. Um, but please be patient and feel free to reach out to the Arthritis Foundation Helpline at arthritis.org forward slash helpline if we are unable to get to your question today. All righty. So to start for our first topic, we'll discuss how attitudes, biases, and inequalities in treatment and care settings affect Black, Amer Black Americans and how to find a doctor that is right for you, okay? Um, I'll start by asking this question first. We've learned that the Black community experiences more pain, greater chances of disability, and delays in treatment and care. But what are some of the key factors that are driving those differences in care? Dr. Dow, would you like to get us started? Yeah, sure. And I apologize in advance for my voice. I'm getting over something, <laughs> but so happy to be here. I think that to answer that question that there are really several factors that drive some of the disparities that we've observed. And it's really a complex, interaction of many of these factors and not just one on its own. For me, one thing that I see a lot of and, and it's a primary issue that I, I encounter a lot is the access to care or access to good care. So I found that many of my patients may be either what I call underinsured and that's when their insurance will maybe cover some basic needs but may not cover more advanced therapies, or some people may actually be uninsured. Um, and when that happens, um, patients may, you know, people may prioritize what they want to do or what they need to do. And with respect to that, then they may seek care a little bit later than others who have great insurance would do. So they may delay coming in to see, um, to see doctors. Also, you will find that depending on the type of insurance you have, um, it may be harder, especially for some of the inflammatory arthritis conditions to get medications that work really quickly um, and 
because there are lots of issues with getting authorization for these medications. And so that may also lead to a little bit of disparity in terms of the severity of the disease and how quickly we can get control. And again, socioeconomic factors are something that we see a lot of. So patients may have difficulty getting time away from work to come to see the doctor or a time away from work to go to physical therapy or to go do exercise. Um, and if you have a lot of child care responsibilities and grandchildren responsibilities, then you may not have the time either to go to that physical therapy or do the things that will be best suited for your health. So I do think that socioeconomic factors and access to care are major issues that we need to overcome. And another thing I encounter as well is we don't really have a lot of good studies or good research for patients of color. Um, what one would encounter is that most of the clinical trials or research studies that are done, um, the majority of the participants are non-Hispanic um, white, white males generally. And so we really don't have a lot of information for on patients of color. And so one of the things that we do at Harvard is that we really try to get involved in clinical trials so that we can have greater representation because knowledge is power. And unless we know what will work for us and what will be better for us, um, then we, we wouldn't know how best to prescribe certain therapies. So there is that misinformation out there where we don't have enough targeted information for our patients of color. There are the access issues, and then there are also the issues related to um, socioeconomic factors as well. And there are others, but <laughs> I don't want to dominate, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Oniki and Dr. Best to see if they have anything else to add. Uh, hi, um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, say uh, thanks to the Arthritis Foundation, for, and I applaud the foundation for putting this together. Um, also very appreciative of the opportunity to be on this uh, distinguished panel and uh, contribute to a discussion that's very important to a topic that's uh, dear to me as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, also want to congratulate uh, Dr. Best for a, a wonderful overview. And uh, just recently, Sharon Dow, my former colleague at Howard University for perspectives on why there are disparities in our, our population, African-American population. Uh, what I'll add to this, uh, very quickly, uh, my own perspective, uh, and I'll share that by saying that I am an orthopedic surgeon that's had the luxury of practicing in a broad array of environments in the US, uh, inner city at Howard, VA Hospital, Unity Healthcare, in the rural area in Richmond and Appalachia, where I did part of my fellowship and uh, private practice in, in Capitol Hill. And I also have an international practice overseas. And so with that in mind, I am, um, privileged to have seen a pretty broad spectrum of, of patients um, that is representative of, of the U.S. population. And to me, I think um, it very often boils down to the root cause of, of the problem. And I think Dr. Dow has, has touched on it uh, extensively, and I think it has to do with the delayed presentation uh, more than anything else. So trying to understand why in the African-American community there's a higher tendency for delayed presentation uh, probably explains why the um, severity of the disease, the burden of the disease, the, the pain and everything else that comes with it uh, is disproportionately affected in, in, in that population. Uh, I think we can continue to dive deeper and expand on, on some of that, but uh, interest of time, I'll stop there and I'll let Dr. Best uh, make some comments if she has any. Thank you. I just want to make two additional comments. I agree 100% with uh, Dr. Dow. Um, I I just want to uh, encourage people that uh, there is help. I do work in a community, uh, excuse me, a community health center on purpose. So I've worked in a variety of practice settings as well. And once I got into community medicine, I just, I, I felt like that was my calling and my passion. So um, there are federally qualified health centers. There's community health centers like mine. Um, there's the websites, the um, um, uh, Bureau of Primary Healthcare has a website where you can put in your zip code and find a site near you. And then also there's the Affordable Care Act, which is available online as well. And even for the medications, like Dr. Dowell said, those medications that are the disease modifying medications are at times very difficult to afford, even for insured patients. But I have a lot of experience finding those medications. And so that's a, a place where the primary care doctor can work with both the patient and the specialist to find options that 
the patient can can afford and, and um, access. So there's patient assistance programs. Those are available online. Um, at our center, we purposely help people fill out those applications um, to get the medication for free if you qualify. Um, but if you don't cross every T and dot every I, uh, your application can easily be rejected. So keep in mind, don't give up. There is help. There's multiple different medication options. So if your specialist uh, prescribes one of those expensive medications, don't just turn and walk away from the pharmacy. Call the, the provider and then know that there is help available or a modification can be made in your treatment plan. One thing I think we didn't touch on um, when it comes to why there's a delayed presentation, I think we do have to look at um, fear and, and mistrust that can often come up in the African-American community. I absolutely agree with you all, great points. Um, but on the flip side, how are cultural attitudes about seeking care for arthritis um, contribute to more poor health outcomes? What advice would you give to patients to combat these attitudes for better care? Dr. Onike, would you like to start? Uh, certainly. So uh, advice to patients, uh, I'd say um, it's best to be as well informed as possible. So um, sessions like this that uh, give us a chance to provide information to patients uh, very useful and beneficial, I imagine. Uh, I think also there are multiple resources um, these days, uh, some very good material on the internet. We just saw an application by the Arthritis Foundation that could be a tremendous resource for patients. And there are many other established organizations and entities that uh, provide patient-directed uh, resources. So patients who are well-informed are best able to uh, represent themselves. Uh, I think also there's, there's a trust factor that, that we see and, and um, um, recognize. Uh, it's systemic. It's not just in, in medicine, but across the board. Uh, people of color, for different reasons, have had um, bad experiences with the system, and that uh, creates some level of, of, of distrust. However, patients trying to seek care and, and uh, do what's best for them uh, can seek, uh, you know, people who have gone through the same trials and tribulations that they have, so to a large extent, word of mouth uh, in their own communities, identifying uh, resources, uh, shared resources, and then also with uh, things in the public domain uh, on, on the internet, uh, trying to find um, you know, providers with, um, uh, that are reputable, uh, whose opinions uh, they, they can trust, uh, will be things I recommend that patients can do to um, seek the appropriate help. And awesome. I, I just like to weigh in there as well that um, one of the things that I've encountered, especially patients who have rheumatoid arthritis or these inflammatory arthritis, and as Dr. Best showed earlier in her slide show, you know, once inflammation occurs and you have damage to your joints, once that damage occurs, it's not reversible. A lot of times when we start medications or we recommend medications, it's to prevent that damage from occurring. And some people who have arthritis think that it's just about the pain. And so, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, well, I can handle the pain because I'm stoic, I can work through this. But I just want everyone to know that it's not really, we're not questioning your strength of character or your ability to tolerate pain because we know that you can. Um, but when we start medications, it's really because we want to treat the inflammation that's present, because as long as that inflammation is present, it can lead to damage to your cartilage. It can lead to damage to your bones and hence to your joints. And when that damage occurs, we can't reverse it. So we want to get medications started as soon as possible to prevent those consequences. I just want to add, um, you talk about the patient uh, factors that may contribute to the undue disease burden in African Americans. And I think that in addition to people believing that, you know, they have to endure the pain and, you know, that some measure of strength, there's also sometimes a faith or religion role where yeah. people might mistakenly believe that if you have faith that you shouldn't seek medical care. Mm -hmm. I'm a person of faith and a medical doctor and there's mm -hmm. no um, discrepancy for me. Um, you can, you know, God can provide uh, 
any any way he wants. He can do a miracle. He can use medications. He can use surgery. So I, you know, that's one myth I think we need to dispel. And the other one is that, um, you know, that this is God's will, or you know, that I'm supposed to suffer, or it's a punishment. Um, you know, again, I think it's a misinterpretation uh, sometimes of our faith to believe that. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, so as we discussed earlier, um, people of color aren't taken as seriously when it comes to reporting their pain. This is a real problem, especially when it comes to stereotypes that black Americans are pill seekers or can tolerate more pain, um, which we kind of just discussed. Um, what should someone do if they feel like their doctor is dismissing their deeds or concerns? Dr. Bess, would you like to weigh in first? Absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, there's been studies on um, having a provider that looks like the patient to see if that improves um, outcomes. Uh, there's been studies that have shown that African-Americans are given less opportunity to have a coronary artery bypass surgery as opposed to medication. And also when it comes to pain, that they are given less pain medication uh, than other races. And so they looked at the studies, if there's a concordance between the race of the patient and the race of the provider, did that help decrease the discrepancy? And it didn't to the extent that we thought it would. So while we can identify with people that look like us and hopefully we can, you know, we would have less bias, we were trained in the system that has generated some of these biases. So even though the provider plays a part in making sure that we treat each patient individually and, and look at their circumstances and not look at their race, uh, the, the patients have some empowerment too. So I think uh, we have to learn to speak up. I believe that um, in my culture, when I was young, you know, you know, the doctor was on a pedestal and even my mother and my family tried to put me on a pedestal and I told them, don't you dare call me Dr. Best. I'm Lydia, I've always been Lydia, so they know. But you know, we have to speak up for ourselves. We have to be our advocates for ourselves or bring someone um, that can be an advocate for us. We have to seek medic information from reliable sources. So um, you know, we don't wanna just look at someone on the internet, we have to look at their, their, um, their credentials. But once we find a reliable source, you know, we can arm ourselves with information. Um, we also want to seek long-term solutions and not quick fixes. So uh, as Dr. Dowell said, you know, we want to look at medications that will modify the disease itself, that would decrease the inflammation that can cause the damage. So um, sometimes it's going to be the long course, the, the marathon, not the sprint when it comes to um, care. But those are the kind of questions we want to ask. Um, we, we can acknowledge our own biases. You know, we talked about the fear and the mistrust. So if we're being led a little bit by fear of the medical profession as a whole, we, we can acknowledge that and then maybe have a discussion um, either with the provider, the nurse, we have community health workers that can, you know, that, that can be that advocate for our patients. So uh, acknowledging biases on both sides of the table can help. And then making sure that we know that we're partners in this. We don't have to go to the extreme of do whatever the doctor says, and we don't have to go to the extreme of we're not gonna believe or trust the medical provider. We're partners. And if there's something that um, you're not comfortable with, it's better to speak up while you're in the office and get an alternative rather than take the prescription and you know not fill it. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, so you put it out, you know, education, advocacy, community. Um, so those are great. And I was also wondering how can patients communicate more effectively with their doctor um, to get the care that they need and to overcome these kinds of biases? Um, I know you definitely mentioned advocating as well. Dr. Dow, would you like to um, try? Yeah, I'd like to echo everything that Dr. Best just said. Um, I think being well informed, you know, allows you to then advocate even more for yourself. Um, I do think first off, if your doctor is not listening to you, not acknowledging your pain, um, 
not partnering with you for you to do better, then you may need to find a new doctor. <laughs> Um, because it's our role to be a partner with you in this journey. Um, and the goal is for you to achieve your, the outcomes that you want to achieve. And so we need to work together for that. I, you know, on a personal level, I do find myself listening more intently when, in addition to clearly describing um, the pain level and where your pain occurs, when you can give me some clear examples of activities that you could do before and now you have difficulty doing. So that gives me an idea of the severity and the impact of this joint pain on your daily life and, and your daily activities. Also, one thing I would like for persons to do is when we give advice, so say we've seen each other and I said to you, maybe doing some exercises would help with your pain or doing physical therapy would help with your pain. And we make um, the opportunity available for you to follow those um, instructions. When you come back, it's really important to share your doctor that you've done these things and let them know whether they've worked or not worked. Um, it, it can be frustrating for the doctor if um, advice has been given multiple times and it hasn't been followed. Um, so I'm not saying that that's an excuse or a reason why someone should not listen to you carefully, but it's also good to be a partner within that relationship because, you know, you have to follow through on the things that we've asked you to do as well. Um, and then you can come back and say, this hasn't worked. And, and from there, we can now begin to craft a better plan that may work better for you. Um, so that's one thing that I would advise is to follow through on the instructions and then come back to say whether it worked or didn't work so we can craft a better plan together. I don't know whether the others have anything more to say. Yeah, I can quickly piggyback off of that. Just to add, um, again, um, the emphasis on being well-informed. I think um, people who know what uh, the nature of their condition is as best as they can from, from their perspective, uh, are going to be better positioned to represent themselves and well informed uh, is you know as much insight as one can have into their own condition but also one one can have into what options are out there and that includes a choice of providers a choice of hospital systems clinics uh, etc uh, so i'll just uh, re-emphasize that point Great tips. Um, I can definitely even say from experience as a patient, being a part of the healthcare team myself, you know, advocating being informed has been very beneficial over the last seven years. So thank you all for putting that out. Um, what are some qualities that patients will look for when it comes to finding a doctor um, that knows how to treat people of color? I would say experience. So. Mm -hmm um experience uh in the community that um that needs your care so um one example i worked in detroit and i was asked to be medical director at the federally qualified health center in in uh predominantly latino community and i said well i couldn't possibly be the medical director if i can't even speak the language so it's it's been 17 years and you know i've i've you know, committed and, and prayed and asked God's help in, in learning the language because language is very valuable and very personal. So um, I'm not saying that everybody has to learn every language that exists, but um, there should be someone in the office that can speak the language of the patient or there's language lines. Um, but uh, I think that goes a long way in, in that comfort level. Uh, I'll also add to that that um, when you do find uh, a doctor, the uh, personality of, of the person and how it impacts the interaction uh, is important. I, I think there are times when, uh, at least I've heard from patients, that they've uh, encountered doctors who cut them off, interrupt them, don't listen to them, uh, don't allow them to uh, fully express themselves. Um, and I think uh, in those situations, it obviously uh, it's a significant disadvantage to, to, to patients. Um, and so um, I encourage patients to um, find doctors that can connect to them, that allow them to leave the encounter, feeling a sense of respect and a sense of a two-way communication uh, stream. 
Uh, I think the nature of medicine, the way it's practiced sometimes requires doctors to, to see as many patients as they can, as quickly as they can and, and move fast. Uh, but it doesn't excuse the, the uh, need for a one-on-one -on -one humane interaction between the doctor and, and the patient. So I think if patients find themselves in, in systems or with providers who do not have that touch, that personal touch, then uh, it's probably a recipe for dissatisfaction in the long term. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I think um, you have you have to have a relationship with your doctor. You have to trust them. So um, it's like finding a really good friend or finding a good church, <laughs> but you have to feel comfortable. So um, for each individual person, that may be different. I did read a narrative written by a patient who was looking for an advice on other patients, actually looking for um, physicians who she thought would treat her equitably. And one of the things that she advised was in the research, looking to see whether this person did their training in an area that was diverse, um, or whether their practice or where their clinical practices are, are in areas that are considered diverse and multinational, um, because that may give you some insight into the clientele that they have and the type of diversities of the patients that they, that they treat. So, I don't know whether, I mean, this is just one person's perspective <laughs> um, and I thought it was interesting. So I'll just share it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so what about for patients who live in an area where doctors treat arthritis, that treat arthritis are limited? We had a audience member who was concerned and they mentioned they like to change doctors, but they don't have any options where they live. Um, mm -hmm. How can they get their doctor to pay attention uh, to their concerns? Uh, it's tough, obviously. Um, not everybody has a luxury of uh, choices, of multiple choices. Um, and I, th I think um, one should not accept things that are unacceptable. And so if, if it's a doctor that's just ignoring the patients and it's an opportunity for the patient to try their best to bring attention to, to, to the problem, um, it's still difficult um, and the patients may run out of options, um, but that's what I would advise is don't ignore it um, in a polite, non-confrontational manner. Um, bring it up to the, to the doctor that your problems are not being, being, being addressed. And sometimes doctors do have blind spots um, and uh, may not do some actions intentionally. Uh, so, so, you know, bringing it up verbally or in written form can still allow for an opportunity for a correction in the behavior. I would always ask, I would also advise as a primary care doctor to see if the primary care provider can be a co-manager. Mm -hmm. So I do feel comfortable. I want the 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 um, patient to see the specialist to get uh, the diagnosis sometimes to get the treatment plan sometimes, but then I can work with the specialist to um, administer that treatment plan at least over the six months or a year or uh, until the time comes that that's not working or um, they need some modifications. Um, so that might be an option. There's also telehealth options. So sometimes that expands the world for us. So if the, the doctor in the community is not as responsive, uh, the primary care doctor or the insurance company might be able to find a telehealth uh, specialist uh, that can do video visits, that can, again, co-manage with the primary care provider. So we have some new options in this new day and age. Thank you, thank you. I think telehealth is a great option. I love when, you know, rheumatologists and my primary care can work together to coordinate care. It makes it so much easier for the patient. Um, so for our next topic, um, we will be talking about working with your doctor to craft a treatment plan that is perfect for you. Uh, so Dr. Dow, I will, um, direct this to you first. Uh, we have lots of patients who wrote in and voiced concern about the kinds of medications they are prescribed, including the fear that doctors may be prescribing them with lesser medications. Um, so this next question has multiple parts. I'll start with the first two. Uh, how do doctors decide which medications to try first? And are there certain medications that are better than others when it comes to treating inflammatory arthritis versus osteoarthritis? Wow. Okay. So 
let me start with the second one first, <laughs> which is whether there are certain medications that are better for treating inflammatory versus osteo. And the short answer to that question is yes. Um, you know, going back to our original presentation that Dr. Best gave, you know, the inflammatory arthritis are conditions where there is inflammation um, external to the joint, which is really attacking the cartilage and destroying it and causing damage. Whereas osteoarthritis is more about damage that occurs within the cartilage and that progresses over time. Um, and so there are different factors that go into what causes these two different types of arthritis. And because of that, there are different medications that are used to treat them. So for the inflammatory arthritis, we use medications that target inflammation. And by so doing, by controlling inflammation, we can prevent damage and joints can live longer and be healthier for a longer time. Whereas in osteoarthritis, unfortunately, we have no medications currently that can reverse the damage that has already occurred. And the treatments for osteoarthritis are more about pain control or symptom control, and also about strengthening the muscles to make the joints um, function better. And so they're two completely different things. Now, how do we decide which medication to try first? Well, this is a decision that we make with you. Um, they are, you know, all of us have um, established like associations or professional entities that we work with and where they've done tons of research and come up with guidelines for, you know, steps that we should take as we're, we're, we're considering a treatment plan. And we use those steps and a discussion with you, the patient, to see what your priorities are, what your concerns are to draft the best treatment regimen for you. So, you know, it may be that if you talk to your friend who has a similar type of arthritis that they're on a different type of medication, but that's because they're not you. <laughs> so um, we really try our best to personalize it and, um, and that helps us to make the best decisions. But in the end, I would say that all doctors are aiming to treat inflammation in the inflammatory arthritis and prevent damage. And then for osteoarthritis, our goal is to advise you on how best to take load and burden off of those um, joints so that you can function better over time. That is great information, thank you. Um, so are there certain medication side effects that are more common in African-Americans and what should those patients look for when um, those side effects come about and how should they notify their doctor? All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at this one. My immediate answer is probably not. Um, however, there is a little bit of a, there is something to mention here in that a lot of African-Americans, especially those who may have some of the inflammatory arthritis, um, we've noticed that they do have a higher number of comorbidities. And we're talking about, you know, diabetes, hypertension, obesity. And sometimes when we're prescribing the medications, we have to be careful about potential interactions with other medications, or we have to be careful that our medications do not um, exacerbate or cause problems because of these present comorbidities. For instance, um, we may use prednisone which is a corticosteroid in some patients who have an inflammatory arthritis, but if they have diabetes, that can also lead to poor blood sugar control. Um, similarly, we may want to use um, what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are like you know ibuprofen or naproxen for pain. But if you have um, you know kidney disease or hypertension or diabetes, again we would want to be careful because it can, they can lead to or exacerbate kidney disease. So I think one of the biggest um, issues that I have encountered has been the sort of increased occurrence of comorbidities in uh, my African-American patients, which then leads me to be, you know, we have to sort of like be a little bit more tailored in how we prescribe some of the other medications. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
All right, we are, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about disease management outcomes. And Dr. Da, I will start with you once again. Um, <laughs> are there genetic components that make African-Americans more susceptible to arthritis than other ethnicities? And I don't, I don't know what the others think about this and I'll throw out to them as well. My, my first thought is no. Um, I think that they are, again, comorbidities that may make things a little bit more prevalent. So, you know, obesity, the type of work that we do, um, these things can exacerbate joint problems a little bit more. Um, I'll ask Dr. to 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 sort of um, to, to comment on whether body habitus can have an impact on hip or knee arthritis, um, but not not particularly gen a genetic predisposition to worse disease than others. I just really think it's more the environmental influences and circumstances that lead to more severe disease. Yeah, I, I think I'll agree with that. Um, I, I think there are some lifestyle uh, issues in terms of uh, career choices, as an example, people who are more in laborers jobs, construction, people in the military, uh, people in, in the army, um, people who played sports, uh, basketball, especially and football to some extent, uh, tend to have a higher incidence of early arthritis than um, others uh, uh, in um, age group comparisons. Um, similarly, uh, people who are overweight uh, seem to have a higher predisposition for, for um, arthritis. Um, there are other risk factors that are um, difficult to tease out the environmental influence versus uh, a genetic influence. Uh, for instance, um, other problems that are ignored, uh, injuries that probably were not addressed um, appropriately early on can lead to a delayed uh, degeneration of the joint later on. So in a society such as the United States, where a segment of the population tends to be disadvantaged across the board, where you see more obesity, where you see other comorbidities as Dr. Dow, where you see pediatric conditions that might be ignored until adulthood, that you might see some uh, impacts and results that might look like they are uh, genetically, um, uh, of a genetic etiology when they are still more, more environmental. But I think one thing that's an eye opener for me is that I, I did do some work in, in Appalachia uh, and that's a very rural Caucasian community and in those communities, you start seeing a lot of the same um, problems that you see in the uh, African-American communities in the, in the inner city. So the common denominator might be more of a socioeconomic uh, status, more so than a genetic status. Yeah, so a lot of factors that impact, you know, disease management and the outcomes. Um, but what does remission look like for people of color compared to other races? Um, and are there ways to avoid permanent damage and disability with arthritis? I'll take a, a first stab at that one. So just remember that we're talking about that arthritis a term. <laughs> In the end, it means joint damage or joint pain, but there are several different types. And so we often talk about remission with respect to the inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and for us, remission means that we have found that inflammation and we have nailed it. We've, you know, it's all completely gone based on the medications that we've given. And some people may be in remission on medication. So it means the medication has induced or has caused remission, or it could be that remission has occurred off medication. We've been able to take the medication away gradually and things have stayed quiet. Um, and it pretty much looks the same across all races, all ethnicities. It's really the absolute lack of inflammation and therefore the lack of symptoms. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Onike, a couple questions here about joint surgery um, that I was hoping you can weigh in on first. So is joint surgery inevitable with arthritis? Um, we've had some people write in saying that they've had a great deal of pain. They're not comfortable with the idea of surgery. What are their options? Uh, excellent questions. Uh, is it inevitable? Um, not so sure there's a good answer to that. There's a natural recognition, uh, particularly with osteoarthritis, that there's a, a gradual decline with time. So there's a trajectory of 
of progression of the problem that gets worse and worse with time. So one can argue that if, if one with osteoarthritis live long enough, then eventually it's more likely than not that they would require uh, a surgical treatment. Um, it's difficult to um, uh, say that that's the case for, for everybody. Um, you know, as far as um, options, um, what I tell patients is that um, it, it makes sense to sort of tailor the presentation to the treatment options. So sometimes surgery ends up being a conservative option and not just surgery ends up being radical. And most often the times it's the other way around. So my approach is to start with the least when I see patients. Uh, if there is a very simple, easy uh, option that manages their symptoms, it could be a brace, it could be a pill, it could be a physical therapy, it could be home exercises, in some cases a, an attempt at weight loss, uh, an injection, and many other options that can be uh, very effective uh, prior to uh, the need for joint replacement surgery. However, um, when um, it becomes so advanced that uh, surgery is the, is the preferred option, then I think it's, it's good for patients to recognize that there can be a game changer that uh, restores their ability to have a good quality of life if uh, surgery is undertaken. It's one that has demonstrated uh, excellent results, um, especially here in the United States where the levels of expertise and the um, standards of care executed at, at a high level. And we can talk a little bit more about surgery if time, if time permits as we go along uh, in the discussion. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, great input. There was a person who asked about, um, they had joint surgery a few years back and they still had some pain. Is this normal? What is to be expected after having joint surgery? Uh, another good question. Um, so the results generally are overwhelmingly favorable, uh, positive. Um, very often I see patients who were so scared of, of having joint replacement surgery and eventually get it. And the feedback I get overwhelmingly is that if they could do it over again, they would have done it earlier uh, because they were so scared and, and eventually uh, the pain and the limitations, uh, everything that comes with it, including uh, in some cases depression um, became to an extent that they had surgery and then they ended up having a good outcome. Um, Having said that, uh, joint replacement surgery requires a level of, of precision, a, a, a level of precision in the surgery itself, and the recuperation, and uh, and 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 um, the the um, management of symptoms afterwards. That when it's well done, uh, tends to give uh, excellent results. Uh, it's not a guarantee that every patient will have that. Uh, there are patients, as you mentioned, who still have pain afterwards. Then it does require a, an analysis by an experienced orthopedic surgeon uh, to see what the reasons might be. Uh, in some cases, there are complications that creep in. Fortunately, they're, they're very rare, but um, when it is a complication, it's best that someone who has the expertise can recognize it. And most of the complications do have uh, treatment options. Awesome, thank you. Oh, yes, Dr. Best. I just wanted to echo Dr. Onike, in terms of, um, I have a lot of patients that are afraid of surgery and some who can't afford surgery for whatever reason, but it is um, tremendously gratifying when I see someone who suffered for years and they finally had the opportunity or took the opportunity to have surgery, knowing ahead of time there is going to be that recuperation phase that um, requires physical therapy, that requires patience. Um, and once they get over that hump, they can look back and they can see um, more function, um, less depression, um, more time to do the things they wanna do. And sometimes losing weight um, is the impetus for the surgery. And sometimes it comes as a result of the surgery because they have more functioning. And so while it's not for everyone and while everyone doesn't have a perfect outcome, I have seen the, the smiles on people's faces after they've gotten over the recuperation phase from surgery. And I'll add one more thing to that to say that, um, yeah, I think there's been this sort of um, attitude uh, across populations that um, you wanna do everything to avoid surgery or that surgery is sort of um, a, a failure that having your condition get to the point of needing surgery indicates some some level of failure. And I think with the results that we are now able to see and offer patients who've had joint replacement surgery, uh, it's probably best that um, 
our communities uh, be educated that, that uh, it requires a reanalysis of of the, the the value of having surgery and an analogy i give some of my patients is that you know people sometimes have a problem with a tooth and they're so scared to see a dentist uh, but at some point, if they wait too long, then it becomes a bigger problem that forces them to see a dentist. And then eventually they get dental work and realize that it wasn't as bad as they were scared of. And then they're happy with the elimination of pain and the ability to have you know, normal function again. And very similarly, people come in and they're so scared they, of having joint replacement surgery. Uh, but the results we're getting these days are really impressive. Um, you know, some good data showing that so, somewhere around 98% of people who have hip or knee replacement surgeries are very satisfied with, with their improvement compared to what they had prior to surgery. Um, I'm fortunate to see it every day. It's, as, a, as a doctor, it's one of the most gratifying things. Uh, I see patients sometimes who could take five minutes to get from the waiting room to the exam room. And within a short period of time after surgery, they're, they're able to walk um, with, with pretty good independence. So those are the things that I encourage uh, people like myself who do surgeries to recommend it to others. And if I could just add one more comment about the term orthopedic surgeon, it doesn't mean that I'm saying you need surgery. There's many other tools that an orthopedic surgeon has that are not necessarily joint replacement. So um, I, you know, I just want to make that plug because when I say the term, I want you to see an orthopedic surgeon the first thing I hear is I don't want surgery. So it's, it's you know, it's unfortunate that 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 um, that name uh, causes fear for some people, but it doesn't mean automatically that you're you're going to have surgery or a joint yeah, replacement surgery. Yeah, yeah. thanks yeah, I'll, for saying I'll that. that. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'll add to that. My mom, by the way, had knee replacement surgery and she took about five years to get there and it was the best thing that ever happened. She could go shopping again, which is something she really enjoyed doing. Um, and I'll just add, I always refer patients and I say, this is not to say you're going to have surgery, but it's to have a discussion about your options. So that they're aware that it's for a discussion and not that they'll walk into the office and have surgery the same day, <laughs> which some people believe will happen. Yeah. Yeah, th thanks for those comments because I, I um, face that where patients come in and um, they're, they're scared because they assume that that's going to be the only option that the orthopedic surgeon is, is going to offer. And there's an African saying that if the only tool you have is a hammer, then every problem becomes a nail. And it's good that <laughs> orthopedic surgeons uh, are people who have a very broad array of management options. We work hand in hand with physical and occupational therapists, with rheumatologists, with pain management doctors. But when it turns out that the surgery, based on uh, the patient's own experience, mostly pain and radiographic demonstration of an advanced condition, then we do have the, the skill and the ability and the knowledge and, and everything it takes to uh, change, dramatically change um, a patient's uh, joint and allows people like uh, Dr. Dao's mom to have a, a new lease on life. So it's, it's a very gratifying position to be in to see patients benefit from it in that manner. Yes, thank you. I've seen it with so many of my patients uh, myself. It's life-changing, so thank you. Um, for our next topic, we will, we will address some of the lifestyle self-management measures um, that Dr. Bess outlined in her presentation. Um, so questions here about diet. Is there a best diet for arthritis? Um, and is there a certain diet to help cure arthritis? What are some uh, resources people can use uh, for a well-balanced diet for arthritis if they don't have the healthiest options in their area? Dr. Bess or Dr. Dow, would you like to provide your insight on this one? I can start us off and then I would appreciate Dr. Dow's um, perspective as well. So again, uh, there is no magic diet. I, um, the most important thing I would say is to get the rainbow of fruits and vegetables because we talked a little bit earlier about supplements and what comes out of the ground is more digestible than what comes in, in a bottle. So if we can get our fruits and vegetables to be our source of vitamins and minerals, uh, along with sunshine, um, then we would have a higher uh, rate of um, improvement from, from diet. Um, diet is a term we try not to use, but healthy eating, um, but that does involve green leafies as well as the rainbow of fruits and vegetables. 
Um, other than that, uh, the, definitely sunshine and vitamin D are very important as well as movement um, to increase the um, stability and the uh, strength of the joints themselves. Yeah, and I will add to that. Um, I think avoiding you know, processed foods, so which is sort of implied by what Dr. Best just said, so you want to avoid the processed foods, the things that we know are bad for us. So <laughs> the fried foods, the flowery stuff, um, you know, the cakes and the donuts. So we really want to try to stay away from those sort of processed foods, um, those overly sweet and sugary foods, and really stay as close as we can to things that are natural and healthy. And I think um, even if you don't have access to say the freshest of um, foods at your nearby grocery, you can still avoid the things that you know are unhealthy. So you can still avoid the frying stuff, and you can still avoid um, you know carbs, which we all know really can exacerbate inflammation as well. Thank you. Okay, right, so we have diet as one of the self-management um, strategies to use. Also, we had someone ask about physical therapy. Is it worth it? Uh, will it hold my arthritis? Um, I can give my perspective as a therapist, but I would like you all to share first. I think physical therapy is, I mean, for me, it's, I think it's definitely helpful. Um, a lot of people, you know, they would say to me that, well, I already exercise, but there's a difference between um, you know, the therapeutic exercises that your therapist can show you, which are good for your joints and can really help target certain muscle groups based on the type of arthritis that you have. Um, I love the, the home programs. So if you can go to your therapist and have them demonstrate for you once or twice the exercises that you can do on your own. And then if you're motivated enough to put a, put a plan in place and continue those exercises on your own, then I think that's great. That way you don't have to go back to a therapist and pay for those sessions on a, a recurring basis. Um, so I think it's helpful because I do feel as if you get sort of more knowledgeable and targeted exercises by going to physical therapy. And I, yeah, I can well. add to, I'm, go ahead, Dr. Nike. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to add to that to say that the uh, problems with people who have um, arthritis uh, results in some weakness in the muscles around the joint and some stiffness. And that sometimes leads to a downward spiral. So your legs are weaker, the loads across the joints become more, more um, put more pressure on the joint and the bones that puts gives the person more pain makes them do less that makes the muscles even weaker and it's a downward spiral so in the, in the early stages before a point of no return um, one can somewhat slow down or in some cases uh, reverse this to a small extent the severity of, of, of arthritis by strengthening and improving flexibility getting better range of motion and there are also other modalities that uh, therapists have uh, to help with pain. There's some infrared and ultrasound and other uh, uh, massages, uh, dry needling, and other techniques that can help with, with pain. Uh, so the idea, as Dr. Dow was alluding to, is that getting those muscles and other structures around the joint to be uh, better optimized can slow down the progression, but can also minimize the symptoms. Having said all of that, that, there is a point beyond which it it's probably doesn't help. And if anything, if anything, patients come out complaining that they have worsening of their pain. Um, and so it probably requires some level of guidance uh, by a primary care doctor or in some cases an orthopedic surgeon to appreciate uh, at one point that it's, it's still uh, potentially beneficial to have physical therapy. And at one point, it's probably just delaying the, the inevitable when it's gone so far. Yes, I agree. Um, even with the pain, movement is critical. Keeping the range of motion, function, strength, always important. Okay. Um, and for our last topic of the night, we will be discussing mental health and its role in managing arthritis. It's a very important topic. Um, Dr. Best, can you briefly talk about the importance of emotional and mental health and why it's so important in the management of arthritis? 
Yes, and I'm, I'm glad you raised this topic. I do think that it's underrated and under discussed and sometimes um, patients feel like if it's something they can do at home, it's not, uh, you know, if it's something your grandmother told you, <laughs> it might not be as effective, but uh, certainly the contrary is true. So there's been many studies on depression and experience of pain. People who suffer from depression have um, higher pain levels than those who um, experience lower levels of depression or have had effective treatment uh, or remission of their depression. Uh, also, sleep plays a very important role in uh, joint health and, and overall health and emotional health, as well as stress. So stress releases hormones that can do damage to any part of the body because they, they go to many parts of the body and the joints are one of them. And water intake is very, very important for joint health. When, when I always tell people when they're dehydrated, their joints feel it first because the arteries that go to the joint, those are some of the smallest arteries. So the, the joints get the least amount of lubrication and we know lubrication is important in joints. So water, sleep, um, stress management, um, are all important factors in pain management. Thank you. Yeah, as you mentioned in the presentation presentation earlier, mind and body are one together. Um, so one affects the other and vice versa. Um, so you mentioned uh, physical health, water. Uh, when is it time to seek a professional help? Um, and what should patients um, call on tonight for a mental health professional? look for in a mental health professional? So I would say um, we do have um, questionnaires that the primary care provider can do and you can, you can do them on yourself. So um, Dr. Dow mentioned, what is it that you used to be able to do that you can't do due to pain? If there's something that you love to do that you aren't doing because of depression, that's a red flag um, because it does become a, a, a vicious cycle. So. Um, Isolation is another important factor. So if you're limiting your activities because of depression and if you're limiting your interactions, we've seen that with COVID, isolation um, worsens depression. So those are two red flags that, that say to me, you need to seek help. That can be a trusted friend, that can be a pastor, that can certainly be a mental health professional. And again, if uh, you don't have insurance, there's still resources for, for mental health. And there's telehealth visits now that can sometimes be more affordable even for, um, for therapy. So keep, keep, keep looking for those resources and don't give up. I'll, I'll quickly add to that, uh, that um, there's definitely um, a, a confounding variable, a negative confounding variable with mental health on the severity of pain and everything else that comes with it, including the need for medications, the failure of uh, traditional medications to address the problem, uh, a limited ability to comply with other instructions, including physical therapy, and perhaps um, some other things that could be a distraction, like a job or being able to, to function in a job. It's a very, very nuanced approach. Uh, very often doctors miss those warning signs and sometimes patients are reluctant and are in denial, uh, but but it is there. It's something that it might be um, a team approach. Um, you know, patients don't really respond too well, in my experience, when I start hinting that there may be something that requires uh, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, so it's, it's difficult to say where it should come from, uh, the primary care, the patient, the specialist, uh, or family members, but I guess collectively, when we do see those warning signs, it's probably important to recognize them and um, involve uh, professional help with uh, handling that component of, of the problem. Um, yeah, um, struggles with mental health can carry a lot of shame and seeking therapy, especially in the black community can be looked down upon. Um, so I'm glad you all have touched the importance of also seeking professional help and social social support in general. Um, I'd like to also point out for our patients who um, are here tonight and may not know where to get started with emotional health, um, that the Arthritis Foundation has a six-week emotional well-being quest available on the VIM app um, that we presented earlier today. Uh, the quest helps you build a self-care toolkit with several mental health strategies to help manage your stress and symptoms with arthritis. 
So please go ahead and check that out. Um, and for our very final question, I'll pose this to the entire panel. Um, if you can please leave our audience tonight with one main takeaway from tonight's conversation, what would it be? Dr. Bess, can you get us started, please? Sorry, I was muted. Um, so my last takeaway is probably my last comment that um, movement matters a lot, that um, movement increases um, function, improves outcomes, actually lessens pain, contrary to what we think. Uh, an analogy I can give is anyone who's lived in the North, I'm from Detroit, um, we know that when we're sliding on ice, we actually have to turn into the into the slide. So the same with, with um, movement. Sometimes we have a tendency to lay in bed. We know for back pain, that's the worst thing we can do. Uh, I'm not saying be a weekend warrior. I'm not saying work out till it hurts. I'm saying work and move until it helps and you will see improvement. Thank you. Oh. Dr. Bell? So for me, I think the one takeaway, and I think anyone who is on this call tonight has already recognized this, and I just commend you for taking control and for reaching out to inform yourselves. But I think it's really important to be informed. Um, by having the knowledge, you can be a better advocate for yourself, and you can be a better partner with your doctor in terms of directing your treatment plans and the goals for your arthritis. So for me, I think being informed is like critically important. And I just want to commend everyone on the call tonight for taking that first step. And I hope you continue to um, join with the Arthritis Foundation and all the available apps and information to keep yourself informed as well. Thank you. Dr. Onike? Oh. That being well informed was also going to be my final takeaway, but I'll make a spin off of that to say that being well informed allows one to recognize that there are uh, a myriad of treatment options that can help uh, patients depending on the stage of uh, presentation that they are at. Uh, and therefore, um, one can get tremendous benefit from a number of options, uh, beginning with the least uh, to the most. And uh, being well informed allows a patient to, you know, put themselves in position to be a recipient of an option that is favorable to them at that stage of presentation that they uh, at. And if it ends up being that surgery is, is what it, it needs, being well informed also allows one to put themselves in the best hands and also participate as best as possible in the, in the recuperative process. Uh, I'll end there. I'll say thanks to everyone who's participated. Uh, thanks to the Arthritis Foundation for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, and I'm um, glad to have met the, the other panelists and everybody else on, on this forum. Thank you. I echo that thanks. Thank you. Same here. Yes, a big thank you to our incredible panel um, tonight for lending their time and expertise. I think I can speak on behalf of our audience that we've all learned something valuable to better our care today. So thank you, thank you. Um, before we sign off for the night, just a reminder that we have several resources and events coming up to help you manage your arthritis. We have JA, which is Juvenile Arthritis and Emotional Health, Navigating the Middle School Years, coming up on June 15th. Um, if you are a JE parent and you, you won't want to miss this one, get advice on how to help your child cope with upcoming um, of age challenges. We have gut instincts, um, the microbiome arthritis connection, which will be on June 23rd at 6 p.m. Um, come and learn about the gut microbiome, how it can impact overall health and possible triggers for poor gut health. Um, to register and learn more about these webinars, including recordings of past events, please visit arthritis.org forward slash webinars. Um, and a reminder, uh, we have our insights program, taking just 10 minutes to fill out the insights assessments um, can help develop programs that speak to what's important to you. Just to note that the Arthritis Foundation has recently launched its JA Insights program. So if you're, in, if you're a parent of a child with JA, we strongly encourage you to enroll in that program as well. 
Um, and last but not least, I'd like to spend, extend a big thank you to our sponsors, Amri, Bristol, Myers Squibb, Genentech, Horizon Orthotherapeutics, and Johnson & Johnson slash Janssen for providing the support to help make this event happen. Uh, as a closing reminder, please note that in a few days, you should receive a survey asking about your experience. Please take the time to fill the survey out completely and honestly so the foundation can best serve you in the future. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight and take care. Thank you.